Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Folks. I'm Robin Hinton. Our first story today features a sampling from a group of people who are growing in numbers. Black urban professionals, buppies is what we call them. And in this report, Sonia Massengill talks to four of them. This is a test. Are you between the ages of 25 and 45? Are you black and did you go to college? Do you hold a professional position? And most importantly, do you make upwards of $30,000 a year? If you do, you're a buppy. And black urban professionals are making the news in record-breaking numbers these days. We found that buppies are more than just carbon copies of yuppies. Let's take a look at four young people under the age of 35 who are making their version of the American dream come true. Meet Mark O'Reilly of Shreveport. Mark has a law degree from George Washington University and recently passed the Texas Bar. Mark works for IBM as a systems engineer. Uh, when I finished school in Washington, I wanted to go into communications, specifically legislation. And I didn't have a lot of background in information systems in that type of area. And IBM and a couple other corporations were good companies to come to, and this wound up to be the best one to come to to get the experience that I needed, and I plan on staying with the company. He feels that loving your work is a key to success. Some people say, you know, they wake up in the morning and, oh, it's another day of work. I don't want to be bothered. I get up and I really enjoy what I'm doing, and that keeps me going every day. I can see, you asked about my goals in 10 years, I can see them as being realistic, and I know that there are things I have to achieve to get to those ends and I get up and I work for it. Um, trying to have a positive attitude about what I do as I do it and trying to get other people to have that same positive attitude. Uh, as they say, success breeds success. Michelle Briere, also of Shreveport, is the director of the Regional Dialysis Center. She has a master's degree in public health from Meharry Medical College. Michelle is 25 years old. What is success for Michelle? Hey, when I have designed some kind of plan and put it to work and it works, that's when I feel successful. But on days where I don't get things accomplished or when things are not really going as I'd like them to, I don't feel successful. Having a high profile career and being single often conflict. I think for the most part men will say that they want an independent female, but when they meet her, that's not, they discover that's not what they really want. I think that um, most men would prefer a female that they can dominate and that a female that can depend on them for things. And a lot of men have told me that I give them the impression that, you know, I could just very well live by myself and you know, live on my own. And I, I usually tell them, well, sure, I could support myself. If that's what you're talking about, sure, you know. But I don't know, I guess I am a very independent person. Carrie and Loretta Puccio of Baton Rouge are in their early 30s. Loretta is an accounts representative for Baton Rouge General Medical Center. Carrie is the economic development officer for the city of Baton Rouge. This busy couple is accommodating both careers, two children, and the renovation of their house. This is a challenge, yet fulfilling for both partners. Uh, well, I took a year off, a year and a half off, when I had the, our oldest, John and spent some time with him at home for, for his first 18 months. Um, and that was nice, you know. Uh, that meant getting out of the work arena for 18 months, which can hurt, you know, with your, your career or whatever you're into. I felt it hurt. Being in a medical field, things change constantly. And to be away from it for that long, you know, definitely changes had definitely occurred. And it, it takes time to pick up again. But if there was, if I had to make the choice again, I would definitely stay home. You know, I do have, have guilt feelings that I didn't stay home with Chris as long as I did with John. So, uh, but it does affect your career. Family and career are priorities for Carrie and Loretta. However, there are some trade-offs. The focus of the achievements changes because uh, if you want to be involved with your family, you necessarily have to focus in on that. And, and it affects your professional life in many ways. These are the Buffies, simply young people who want the better things in life and are willing to work hard to make it. 
How do they feel about the term Buffy? I know it sounds awful. When I first heard the word, it sounded like something undesirable until you explained it to me. I think today that's a minority person and, and not necessarily a black, but may encompass lots of minorities that are finally reaching a successful point in their careers. They are seeing their dreams from childhood come true. Faddish, I don't know. And I don't really like fads. So I don't want to be a part of something that, you know, because everybody else is being this way or doing these things, unless it's, you know, a positive thing. Buffy's have been characterized as having a lack of concern for the black community. We found that this just isn't so. I guess I sit on at least five different boards, and my thing is to improve the community. I have probably not focused in uh, specifically on black activities as such, but activities that, such as the Family Counseling Service and the Cerebral Palsy Foundation, things that affect humanity. And, and uh, that's just where my particular head is, you know. It's to, to help all of mankind. Well, just recently, um, I've contacted some people about getting involved. What I'd like to do is work with youth in the community. And I was discussing it one day with a friend, and we thought maybe the best way would be to maybe get a Girl Scout troop. And we're both professional people, and we felt like we had a lot to offer on that aspect. And that way, we'd have you know constant contact with the same group of girls, and maybe we could be a positive influence in some way. What is it like when black urban professionals find themselves in situations where they're the only black urban professional or one of very few? Sometimes lonely. Sometimes feeling is socially isolated. And for the most part, the people that live in Shreveport are, are an older crowd that have been here for a long period of time. And they might have children my age, but their children don't live here anymore. I still think that if I were white, I would have uh, much more materially and every, every, in every other respect. Uh, it doesn't mean that I cry in my pillow at night, because I love my life. And, and I've already identified myself as a, su a successful person. Uh, God only knows why, <laughs> you know. But, but um, I think in relative terms, I'd have to say that. If I didn't, I'd, I'd think the gods would punish me, you know, because I have been blessed so much. Is there a formula for being a black urban professional? There are certain common traits. Education and career preparation, certainly. Well, I always tell everybody it's luck because I really had no intentions of staying in Shreveport. I saw the job advertised in the paper and just applied. And also, you know, that it doesn't take someone, you know, graduating magna cum laude to, to get a good job. That it just takes some good, basic common sense and, you know, willing to a willingness to be successful. I think the number one obstacle is one that says, I can't. And when someone says, I can't, then you won't. But if you go in thinking that, yes, I can, no matter what anyone says, you will do it. Just be persistent, and you'll succeed. I take it all with a kind of a, both a grain of salt and a sense of humor, you know? I try to be very philosophical, and I try not to lose sight of my own ambitions. Uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. Of course, I've never been anybody else. But basically, the challenge is so marvelous that I'm almost sorry for people who don't know all, all about that challenge. Life and everything is only as much as you put into it. And that's the same with marriage and your professional life. Uh, and so that's it's simply what I think the average young professional person would tell you, uh, that uh, it's all only as good as uh, um, as you make it. That, that sounds so cliche, but it's, uh, it's definitely true. Our next story features a woman who can best be described as a dancer choreographer. Her dancing feet have taken her from New Orleans to the Soviet Union. This is one of the modern dance classes at the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts. It is taught by 28-year-old Lula Elzey, a native New Orleanian. Dancing is Lula's life. So she says. Life, you know, dancing um, is also the thing of youth. Like people go through a whole trend of trying to stay young all their lives. But if you're a dancer, you found that fountain of youth because it keeps you alive. And then you work with children and you're on the stage and you have to have all of that energy. 
but it hasn't always been that way. You see, she developed her interest in dancing at age 17. Very, very late. I have always gone to the ballets, and especially the people that were doing holiday on ice, you know, seeing all the skaters, and look at pictures in the book, and then try to figure out how they were doing the steps. And uh, I was basically a shy person, so when I started to dance, everybody was surprised. <laughs> You know, but that, that would pique my interest because I, I love to see the body moves across the stage and all the energy. And I say, yeah, that's what I want to do now. Lula also attended the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts. But after graduating from high school, her original plan was to become a history teacher. Well, I was going to Southern University in New Orleans and I was working. And I was also dancing with an African company. And one day I was in class and through a history test, I said, well, you must be crazy or something. You can't do it all, so you have to make a decision. And as I worked, I saved a lot of money, and I decided to go to New York. And once I got there and saw all the people that were dancing, and they were waiting on tables and all that because they loved the art so much, you know, it just kept me going and going. And I said, well, if they could do it, I could do it. But dancing became an obsession. And in the summer of 1978, it took her to New York, where she danced in Alvin Ailey's summer program. It was wonderful uh, at the Alvin Ailey School because they had so many people there who really wanted to dance, you know. And you go into the building and everybody was always stretching and the music was going and you hear the teachers screaming and shouting and everybody was sweating. You know, you say, wow, <laughs> this is going to be like, I'm going to give this a try. And it was like basically 50 to 60 people in class, so you had to do everything and do it very well so the teacher noticed you and noticed that you were interested in being a dancer and that you were there to work. And then you had to go every day. You know, you don't want to go one day and then skip five days. They don't remember who you are. But uh, that was a wonderful school to start at because we had to do ballet, the jazz, the modern and also Dunham, which is close to the African style of dance, so it was great. Four years later, Lula danced her way to Russia. That was interesting. It was wonderful because all the people who were there who were dancers were dancers, you know. They, they were going to be their whole life, and you could tell, you know, they were very serious. And then when you have 80 people and they're all good, you know, it gives you something else to strive for. So that was an interesting trip. I enjoyed that. In addition to teaching, Lula is the director and choreographer of her own dance troupe called The Performing Company. Ah, The Performing Company. <laughs> I was dancing with like three other groups and uh, other people were doing the choreography and I just loved to dance. I just wanted to dance so it really didn't matter but as time went on and people were moving in and out of town having different opinions what things should be and so I decided that um, I should form my own little group. At first I thought about no more than about five or six people and then people started to get interested and so it, it grew to about ten. And some of the people that I've danced with before in the past joined the group and then I got stuck with doing the choreography so that was something new. But back in the classroom she puts her students through the paces. Um, to enjoy it. Whether the students want to be dancers or not, you know, whether they just want to sit in the audience and appreciate dancing or appreciate any form of art. If they're doing it themselves, then they understand the hard work that went into it and all of the aches and pains that it took just to do one step. So every time I teach them, so I tell them to enjoy, to smile, to tell themselves they love what they're doing, although their body really hurts, <laughs> you know, they'll get over it, you know, and the sweat, everything is worth it. Even though Lula started dancing at a late age, she feels she has many good performing years ahead of her. And it vanished to a certain extent uh, because I feel now that I can go on till about 45. <laughs> Some dancers start really, really early and then they have to stop about 30. But I think I could dance right through those years. And the disadvantage is that if I would have started younger, I think I would have had more technique. And that's the basis because when the talent goes, the technique lasts. So in the process of being a dancer and a teacher, I still have to take more classes and, and a great deal of basic classes so I could really get into all of the technique of dancing. And if you're wondering between teaching and performing which she finds more rewarding, well, Lula says... Performing. <laughs> 
I say performing because I, I like the, the feeling and the growth of it. And I love to see the people in the audience react and to say that they wouldn't come backstage and say, I've enjoyed it, and how did you do it, and how long did it take you to do it? And, you know, I like teaching also because I understand the problems of some students starting very late, you know, being a dancer, so. But the performing is, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Okay, we are now going to shift our attention from ballet and modern dance in New Orleans to bopping in Natchitoches. It is there we caught up with Al Furrier, who in some international circles is considered to be the king of rockabilly. Situated on the banks of Sibley Lake in Natchitoches Parish is the Southern Comfort Lounge. It is there we had our first experience with rockabilly music. Rockabilly is a country tune speeded up. I was writing songs back when I was a kid, and I just wrote a country song and me and the band speeded it up. So they say that I'm the first one that ever wrote a rockabilly tune. Well, hey little baby, let's go downtown. Do the rockabilly when the sun goes down. Let's rock. Let's rock. Let's do the rockabilly, baby, when the sun goes down. Well, I got my guitar, you got your rock and shoes. Oh, little baby, let's rock away the blues. Let's rock. Let's rock. Let's do the rock a belly, baby, when the sun goes down. Ah, oh, let's rock a belly now. Shake it, little baby, and move it all around. Do the rock a belly when the sun goes down. Let's rock. Let's rock. Do the rock a belly, baby, when the sun goes down. You're the prettiest little woman that I've ever seen. Come on, little baby, and I'll show you what I mean. Let's rock. Let's rock. Let's do the rock a belly, baby. Al Furrier is the man behind the vocals, and many people in the international music industry consider him the king of rockabilly. There's a guy by the name of Hank Hogberg came over uh, from uh, Switzerland, and he was looking for songs for other people to record from overseas. And uh, he came down to the Gold Band Studios in uh, Lake Charles where I recorded a lot of records. And he got this record called Let's Go Boppin' the Night that we'd recorded down there. And he brought it back home. So they started playing it around. I said, well, we'd rather have the man on that record like it is, you know, than uh, for anyone else to record it. So it made a hit over there in 1975 and got on the charts. Furrier's music is doing exceptionally well in Europe. A lot of his success there can be attributed to French disc jockey Ferdinand Semino. Old, old music is selling over there now better than the new stuff. That's, you know, they like, uh, they still love Elvis Presley over there. And, and they buy uh, most all the records I put out. Uh, I have a DJ over that played uh, nine of my records in, in an hour on one of his shows. And uh, I, I think, you know, he must like it by that. <laughs> he sent me a tape of it. Of course, I couldn't understand what he's talking about. He's talking in French. <laughs> but uh, we brought it to a French teacher here in Nactus, and she uh, changed it where we could, and, and back into English. And he's calling me the king, you know, and stuff like that, which made me feel good. Furrier says rockabilly music was born back in the early 1950s. Before Rockabilly, he played country, heavily influenced by the music of Hank Williams. What you got cooking? I'm about cooking something up with me. Back in the 50s, when I hear him sing on the radio, I try to sing the love sick blues like him, you know, and that was hard to do. I don't think nobody else could do it, just like Hank Williams. And uh, I started playing over in uh, Gaston, Alabama and started singing some of his songs. I was on the Midway Jamboree in Gaston, Alabama, which every time I would sing one of his songs, 
That's how, you know, people would applaud real good. So I started writing my own songs, and uh, I just sort of got the urge from uh, Hank Williams. Furrier has recorded 14 albums. Here is a look at some of them. He says his favorite is country with sax. I was the first man that ever put a saxophone on a country record down at the Gold Van Studios. I was the first man that ever did that. The guy that owns the record company down there, when I walked in, and then I had a guy playing saxophone with me. His name was Jack Hooter. He used to make Alexander, Louisiana. And he said, well, what's this big tall guy gonna do on this? We had the steel guitars and all that stuff, We're gonna cut a country session. I said, he's gonna blow sax, saxophone on it. He said, we can't use a sax on the country record. We've got to have a steel, because the radio station won't play it, and they wouldn't. But we've cut a record called I'll Try One More Time, got number 10 in the charts, and every radio station around was playing it. And after then, I heard saxophones on all kinds of country music. But I was the first man that ever put a saxophone on the country record. Back in the 50s, Furrier played in the Louisiana Hayride. He says another singer at the Hayride asked to record his first rockabilly song, but he said no. A new Furrier says he would later regret. Well, I played the Louisiana Hayride four times, and the four times I was up there, Elvis was there. And uh, he uh, wanted to record Let's Go Bop in the Night. He asked for it. He said, send this song to uh, Sam Phillips in Memphis, Tennessee for me, and I'll record it. And I said, well, I'll try to put it over myself, which I made a bad mistake. That's one bad mistake I made by not letting Elvis record it. And he was just breaking That's All Right Mama in, you know, then. And I should have let him have the song to record. Let's now listen to the song that Elvis wanted to record. Well, hey, baby, come on over here and let's go popping tonight. Well, hey, baby, come on over here and let's go popping tonight. Well, I'll always love and I'll always treat you right. Well, I got the car, got the moon. Come on, now, baby, let's have some fun. Hey, pretty baby, come on over here and let's go popping tonight. Well, I'll always love and I'll always treat you right. Furrier and let's go bopping tonight. Well, that's folks for another week. Thanks for watching. We hope you can join us again next time. We'll see you. Bye-bye.